everybody. It's Nick Weiss, the lead pastor of the Fervent Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's message where we hope you're challenged, encouraged, and strengthened in your walk with Jesus today. If you have any questions about following Jesus or what the Bible means, please send your emails to connect at fervent.church, and we would love to answer those questions for you. Now, for more information about our ministry, visit us online at fervent.church, and remember, it's all so that people may know Jesus. So today's message title is The Little Things, all right? How many of you guys know that little things matter? How many of you are like little things type of people, all right? Some of you are like, I don't care about anything, right? You know, like, I don't care about the little thing. I don't care about the big things, you know? It's just, but some of you are like, little things matter. Maybe some of you are like OCD. I don't think I'm OCD. My wife would probably agree, right? I'm not, like, I'm not super OCD, but little things matter. It's like, let's just paint the picture for a second, right? Some of you are like, well, I don't care about little things. Well, what about things people say? Like little things, right? It's just like, oh man, like why'd you wear that? And you know, and it's like it's the little thing, doesn't matter at all. But then later in the day, you're like, this is a nice shirt, you know. It says Jesus. We mean, why am I wearing this, right? My uh, my daughter will say that sometimes. Daddy, why are you wearing that? It's like, I thought I looked pretty good today, and now it's just a little thing. But then it can make a big difference. Anybody felt that way before? Like just someone says anything earlier this week. Uh, I won't share too much, but the, oh, I don't know. We'll share whatever. People judge. Right, they're like, you don't look like a CrossFit coach, you know. It's like one of those things. It's like, well, let's throw down, put some weight on the bar. You know, I didn't say that, <laughs> um, but little things can get to you. Um, but then also, little things can uh, like absolutely build you up. It just makes your day. Someone just says, "Hey, thank you for doing that." All of a sudden, you just feel appreciated. Like I wasn't even looking for a thanks, but all of a sudden, it's like it, it makes a huge difference. Little things matter. Our words matter, of course. The uh, proverb says that. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. I don't know if you realize that, but literally our words have the power to bring life or to bring death into our lives and the lives around us. Our words matter, and most of us are like, oh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me or whatever. That's a bunch of garbage that we learn in elementary school. It's like words matter. Words matter. Little words, little things that we think are un- insignificant can make a huge impact for the good or a huge impact for the worse or the worst in people's lives. Now, not only words matter, but little actions, right? Those things matter. Um, Not long ago, this last year, I read a book called Atomic Habits. How many of you have read this book or heard of it, right? If you listen to any type of podcast about, I don't even know, what's the topic, like motivational stuff, they quote this guy at some I hear about him every single week in some podcast or a sermon. It's like it gets in and here's mine here, you know. So someone's listening to it. Man, I can't get away from this guy. But Atomic Habits, written by this guy, James Clear. I don't know if he's a Christian. I don't think he is. It's not a Christian book. But he writes it. It's really all about little things. Atomic Habits, like the smallest thing in that we know of is an atom, right? And anyways, it can make huge um implications and changes in our lives and he talks about building these habits little tiny one percent changes um, that you would do every single day every week every month and now Kobe Bryant to bring in another one to illustrate this he said this once you know um, and man, it's really too bad that he you know crashed on that that helicopter man because he this all this stuff comes out it's like it's just pure gold but he says this he's like you can't do it all in a day but he's like at the end of the day you look yourself in the mirror and he's like did I get better today not like did you win the championship or anything he's like did I get better today and he's like if the answer is yes he's like then awesome like that's a win and he's like you do that every day every day every week every month every year and he's like you don't just get it all in a day like hey I want to be the best Kobe Bryant also said that hard work outweighs talent any day of the week, right? And that's huge, right? Because you're like, you're so talented. And I think if he was here today, Kobe would be like, I wasn't that way to start out. But he was just so driven to put in the work on the little things. It's the little things that make a huge difference in our life. And it's not the little things that you just do once, right? That can make a big difference. But if you do the little things every day, every week, every month, every year for the rest of your life, Like, imagine what is possible. 
Now, that's like a real great motivational speech, like, oh, and go out there and kill it in the business world. But let's just think about that in the spiritual sense of what Jesus has given, because this is really why we're here. We're not here to make a living in an empire for ourselves. We're here to make Jesus' name known and that people may know Jesus. And so just think about that, the little things in our life that we could do every single day, every week, every month, every year for the rest of our lives that can make a huge impact for the kingdom of God, like saying like, hey, can I pray for you? It's a little thing. You ever felt the urge to ask somebody that? Like, hey, can I pray for you? I mean, I've felt this and I've done it like a lot of times, but I've also not done that a lot of times. Like, I think I should ask them, uh, can I pray for you? But I'm like, it's weird. It's late. I'm tired. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, it's been a long day and you make excuses and you justify it and you don't do that little thing that could change everything for someone's life. And if we just had that mentality, what might be possible and what might might we see um, God do in our lives and through our lives, right? The little things matter. They matter to you, whether you realize it or not. They matter to your spouse, right? How many of you guys are married and you know, like, if you leave that one knife on the counter that you're going to use later on, it's the little things that drive them crazy? No, just me? Any, huh? Five knives, all right, yeah, you got your peanut butter sandwich, your regular butter, <laughs> what? no, like, I would leave my, oh, all right, Amber said stop, right. <laughs> no, but I used to do, I still sometimes do that, but anyways, it's the little things in life that matter to you, your spouse, your family, your friends, and honestly, most importantly, to God, he cares about the little things um, in our life. And so today we're going to look at possibly the most well-known miracle of Jesus. And you probably know this if you've been in church for any length of time. If you went to Sunday school as a kid, you've probably heard this. And if you haven't, it's weird that you haven't, to be honest. But it's the, it's the only miracle besides Jesus' resurrection that's mentioned in all four Gospels. And it's the feeding of the 5,000. Now, how many of you are familiar with this? You've heard it to some degree or another. You don't need to know it all, you know, and be able to explain it all, but you've heard of Jesus feeding the multitude, 5,000 people. Now we'll see here in the, the chapters that these 5,000 people, he's saying these are 5,000 men. I believe it's Matthew's um, account where he says it's 5,000 men besides women and children. And now um, we we're talking with my oldest son about this and he was talking about it and he's like, well, if there's 5,000 men there's probably 5,000 women, and then there's probably 5,000 kids. He's like, that's 15,000 people. And I'm like, that's like conservative, if you ask me, because I'm like, how many kids does each family have, right? I have three kids, right? But so conservatively, um, 15,000 people Jesus feeds, and it's a miracle, and it's his most well-known one, really, um, of course, besides his resurrection and all that. Um, but it's mentioned in all four gospel accounts. Now to set some context here, let's read through a little bit. Um, we'll read um, John chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1. He says this, he says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And now again, to bring it into context, what's going on? Well, Jesus is on the scene. He's on the move. He's healing people. We saw last week in John chapter five that he heals this guy who's at this pool of Bethesda. And he's like, hey, do you want to be healed? And the guy's like, well, I'm trying to get healed, but someone keeps coming in and taking my place, right? And then Jesus tells him what? Take up your bed and walk. And then the next thing you know, you'd think everybody be ecstatic, Right? Oh man, that's crazy. You know, everyone just, woo, like this guy has been this way for 38 years and now he's healed and he's up walking around. Now the thing about it, if you remember, what day was it? The Sabbath day, right? And so the religious leaders, they weren't very pumped about this. They weren't like, hey, that's cool, man. You're, you're, heal you're healed. Praise God. Man, it's so awesome, man. And no, they're like, who healed you? And he's like, well, I don't remember, I don't know his name. He just told me what to do, pick up my bed and walk. And I've never done that before. And I got up and I walked. And so now I'm here. And then he finds him later on. Jesus comes to him in the temple, says, hey, praise God. He's like, go on and sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And then the guy finds out it's Jesus. And then Jesus gets in this trouble kind of, I say trouble, but it's not really trouble. But with the religious leaders, because they don't like that he's healing 
on the Sabbath day. Now, if you remember last week, Jesus had some pretty like harsh words, and I want to just read this part real quick. Verse, this is chapter 5, verse 39. He's talking to these religious leaders, and he tells them that you search the Scriptures because you think in them that you have eternal life. And he says, it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And I just want to highlight that again, because taking that into context, he's healing people, all kinds of cool stuff's happening. And I would say the majority of people following him are not the religious leaders. They're the ones who are, they're sick. They're the ones who need a healing. They need something, and they're probably the outcasts, and now they're following him. But then the religious leaders, they're looking at Jesus like, hey, why are you healing on the Sabbath? You're not allowed to do that. Now, if you look at this and do a further, deeper dive into it, like they're, the religious leaders, their law, I say that in quotes, is based off of their interpretation of God's word, right? Because God's word says that you should rest on the Sabbath day. Now, they took that, their interpretation is rest on the Sabbath day means you can't do any work at all, period. And I, and I think it might even be still true today, but at one point, um, in Israel, you go there on the Sabbath day, like you literally, like the elevator, it, it just goes up and down because you can't push a button because they believe that's work. I don't know if that's true today still. I've heard that from my pastor who's been to Israel. Anyone confirm that? Yeah, we can confirm. All right, yeah, you can't do it. It's work, right? What are you doing pushing the elevator button? You're like, well, that's where my hotel room is on floor number on three. You know what I mean? And well, I can't take the stairs either. That's work. It's like, that's religious leaders, or that's um, legalism, which is really just man's interpretation of God's word, which their interpretation is wrong. Do you know this, that sometimes our interpretation can be wrong? That's something we need to be aware of, right? For me, it's like, I really want to be aware of that. I don't want to teach something that's wrong that doesn't actually mean what God's word means. But I just love this part where he says this, and this is a warning to us, it's like don't, that they search the scriptures, but what about us? We search the scriptures because we think in them we have eternal life, right? Like you can know this whole book front to back, memorized it, and the, the scribes, the Pharisees, they would be able to do it, right? You could tear out half of their Old Testament or whatever and be like, all right, hey, quote to me Psalm 22. And they'd probably be like, oh, well, that's easy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yada, yada, on and on and on, right? Like they would know it. But at the same time, they don't know anything of what it's about. Psalm 22 is a powerful, prophetic psalm of Jesus' uh, life, death, and crucifixion, um, which is very like graphic if you read through it. But they knew the words, but they didn't know what they meant. And there's a danger in that. Like You can know all these things if you try to just memorize all this scripture, yet you're clearly missing the point of what the scripture's saying. It doesn't really matter. Right? We want to know Jesus, and it's like God's word speaks of Jesus, and in it we find life. And so he gives that warning there to the uh, religious leaders, the legalistic people. And again, it says, after this, he went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and it says a large crowd was following him. Well, this is also probably not like tomorrow, right? Like, hey, talk to the scribes and Pharisees, and then the next day he's going across the sea, right? And I say that because we see in verse 4, he says, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Right, if you go back a few chapters, chapter 2, there was a Passover happening when Jesus went to the temple and flipped over the tables. Everybody was there. They're coming to worship to pay and um, their, their dues, right? offer their sacrifices. Now here we are a few chapters later. There's another Passover. So there's been at least a year in this whole portion. Right? It seems like we're just like, oh, we've just been going through a week in Jesus' life. No, like we're covering a lot of ground and John's giving us very specific details of like, hey, what do I need to tell people so they can get to know Jesus so that they could have eternal life with Jesus? And he's giving us the, these details. And so, but he's going on, he says, this is the, the Passover's happening again. Um, there's three Passovers that happen. Um, some argue there might've been four, a fourth um, with Jesus' life. But the first one, him at the temple, flipping over the tables, the second Passover happening right here in this time frame of when he's feeding the 5,000. You know when the third one was? Pop quiz. Got a free uh, bagel muffin for anyone who gets it right. It's when he was crucified. Did someone say that? That was the third Passover. 
Like he was the Passover lamb, and it's very clearly telling us a few things. For one, he goes into the temple, flips over the tables, like he has all authority, all this stuff. It's, it's uh, very uh, powerful. The second one, which we're looking at today, is like um, he feeds the 5,000, showing us that he's the bread of life, that he is the one who sustains us. That's kind of the bigger picture of this whole uh, feeding the 5,000. Um, and then the third one, it's like, well, he is the Passover lamb. Um, and it's just powerful stuff. And so this is happening. The Passover is going on. Um, and uh, yeah, verse 3, I skipped over this one. Jesus went up on the mountain, and, he, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now again, there, each gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record this event. And if you read through them all, they all give us a little bit different details, so we get this fuller picture, which is pretty cool. I encourage you to go read through them maybe this week, right? But the, the Passover is at hand, and so to set a little bit more context, um, a lot has happened since um, his, I don't know, his meeting with the religious leaders. One thing that's happened that is noteworthy that John doesn't tell us, but Matthew, I believe, and Mark tell us, is that John the Baptist, you guys know what happened to him? He got killed, right? Yeah, someone went, ooh. He got his head cut off. That's literally what happened. And so Herod, he didn't like him, but the person who really didn't like John the Baptist was Herod's wife, who was actually Herod's brother's wife. And John the Baptist is like, hey, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And then his brother's wife's like, hey, who are you? What are you doing telling us how to live and who I'm supposed to love? And I don't know what the whole situation and conversation went. But later on, um, Herod's daughter comes and is like, hey, well, like, what, what should I ask for? Dad basically said, he'll give me anything that I want, right? And then she's like, I want the head of John the Baptist. And what happens? Well, he has John the Baptist killed, um, and John the Baptist is killed. Now, context coming into this, right? We're going to go right into this feeding of the 5,000. But one of the things is Jesus is retreating because he's just found out that John the Baptist has been killed. Right? If you've ever gone through this, I mean, I know it's a terrible thing, but we will all face it at some point. If we haven't already, you lose a loved one, your friend, a family member, and it's hard. You just don't want to be around people. Right? And that's normal. You just kind of want to retreat, get away. That's what Jesus is doing. He's going to the mountaintop. He says that I'm going to go away to a desolate place. He actually tells um, in other accounts, he tells the disciples you go away over there across the, the sea. I'm going to go away to a desolate place because, like, a lot's going on. Um, and that's just kind of typical, right? And so John the Baptist, he's been killed. Jesus is trying to get alone by himself here. And then Matthew 14, this is the other account of it, it tells us that when Jesus got to the other side of the shore, that he saw a great crowd. Mark tells us that there's people, like, as Jesus is in the boat going across the sea, that people are actually running around the lake and they're running over there like, oh, like, where's, where's he going? You know what I'm saying? Like you could picture this. Like Jesus probably sees them the whole time. Like I'm trying to get away and they won't leave me alone. I don't think Jesus was annoyed, by the way, but we would be, wouldn't we? Um, but the people run on to the other side, meet him over there. And there's this great crowd waiting there. And then the, the disciples are there. And then Jesus gets with them and the disciples. And they're there. They're trying to probably find some peace some rest. I think it's Luke 9. He tells us that, um, that they were so like wearied from their day. They're trying to find this rest um, and that they haven't even got anything to eat yet. Um, and so they're, they're on this way over there. But let's um, look at uh, verse 5 of John chapter 6. So he goes over to this other side, or he sits down with his disciples, says, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread that these people may eat? Um, and so if you just kind of think about the context, they've had a long day. The day's growing, you know, old or whatever the saying is. Um, they're hungry. Jesus even says it at one point. Again, I think it's Luke 9 that tells us, that they're growing weary, that they're trying to get food. Uh, Jesus has been healing people. They just found out about John the Baptist. Like, it's been a long day, uh, and they need some food. And then Jesus responds. He sees the large crowd. He says to Philip, and John's the only one who tells us the names of some of these disciples, by the way. He says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? 
All right, other accounts of this same thing in Matthew and Mark, right? It says that these people are like, they, that the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, tell them to go away and go back home and get food from their own house because like it, the day's over, we're tired. That's basically the idea you get. You guys read this stuff? You're familiar with this? It's like, tell them to go away, Jesus, right? For the disciples, like, they're like, I, I want to see miracles and all that stuff, but like I also want to see the inside of my eyelids tonight, and I want to sleep, you know? Like, and they're almost like overwhelmed, burnt out. And Jesus, in and, and the other account, says, you give them something to eat. I, like, tell them to go home and get their own food. And Jesus like, you give them something to eat. Here in John chapter 6, he says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Right? That would be an overwhelming question. When you're already tired, you're exhausted, you've already heard some bad news um, about things going on. It's the end of the day. Jesus is like, where are we going to buy some bread for these people so that they may eat? Verse 6, he said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. When Jesus asks us to do something or ask a question in our life, he's asking, I think, primarily to test us. I believe it's 2 Peter or it could be 1 Peter. One of his letters, he says that, that, that testing comes to prove our faith genuine um, when testing comes, right? It's like Jesus is going to test us at times. And it's often in little ways. In little ways, where are we going to buy bread? You're like, what does it matter? Jesus, like, you know, he goes on. He says, 200 denarii won't be enough to feed these people, right? And 200 denarii is 200 days wages. That's eight months, right? So just think if you saved up what you make in eight months, and Philip's very just logically thinking, you know, eight months wages will not feed this many people so that they can even get a little bit, right? And that's the problem. We often look at things logically like in the physical sense right jesus says to do something and you're like how's that going to work but he's doing it to test us it's a little thing it's a little test and it's like are we going to pass or are we going to fail he says he says um where are we to buy some bread so these people may eat he said this to test him for he knew what he would do verse 7 philip answered him 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little Right? So even if we had eight months wages right here and we went to the grocery store to, to buy as much bread and food as we possibly can and we get the cheap stuff and whatever, he's like, it's not even enough for everybody to get a little, which gives us this idea that this is a huge crowd. Right? Again, 5,000 people. The other accounts tells us 5,000 besides men or besides women and children. So probably 15,000 conservatively. Like, that's a conservative amount, but it's realistically, I mean, it's probably 20,000 plus people. Like, we're talking a huge crowd. And Philip's like, we can't feed these people. This is impossible, Lord. And verse 8 says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, said to him, there's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they to so many? All right, Andrew finds this boy. Now, I wish we had more information on this. I really do. Because I wonder whose boy it is first. Is this Andrew's son? Is it Peter's son? Is it Philip's? Is it whose son is this? Who's this little boy? What's he doing walking around? Like, you know, like how old is he? Just any of this information would be fun for me to know. But Andrew finds him, whoever he is, he finds him, hey, there's this little boy and he's got a Lunchable. Right? My wife like thinks it's funny sometimes when I always refer to it as a little boy's Lunchable. But it literally says this. There's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. And like, it's a, it's a lunch. And you might think of like Aladdin and he's just loaded up with like, you know, big, huge loaves of bread in his backpack and he's stealing it or something. But like these loaves would be more like some crackers or cakes, like they're preserved. Like, and when I think of this, I think of those like Belveda, what are those things, those little crackers? Anybody have these? Right? No? Yes? No? Maybe so. Uh, anyways, they're pretty tasty, probably terrible for you. But I think of those when I think of these, like they're barley loaves. Now, barley is like the cheapest of the cheapest stuff you can get. So it tells us that this boy or at least his parents are probably poor. They don't have a lot of money and he has barley. Barley would be something like for us today that we would make dog food out of. Like you don't eat that. Like we make dog food and you can feed it to them. Barley you'd feed to the animals. Um, that was something that you would feed. That's just how it was. Now he has barley loaves five of them and again they're probably five like biscuit sized things and he has two fish 
Now he's not walking around with two ahi tunas in his backpack that are 300 pounds each, right? And even if he did, I think he'd be like, what is this to this many people? Um, he probably has like little fish and it's probably either pickled or um, salted because it's like it's a preservative for them to actually carry around. This is a little boy's lunch. That's what it is. And he's like, hey, we found this boy. He's got a little bit of food, Jesus, but let's just be honest. What is this to so many people? Now, do you ever think this in your own life where like Jesus asked you something like, hey, why don't you start serving or giving or go check on that person? And you're like, but what does it matter? What does it matter? Like, what's my little bit to, to such a big problem? You ever thought that? And you talk yourself out of even helping out or serving or giving or checking in on someone, whatever it is, fill in the blank. It's like, you know God's put it on your heart, and you're like, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, really. What is it to so many? And we just talk ourselves out of, honestly, I think, seeing a miracle at times. Well, God, like, I know you... you for me, like this is early on, like coming back to Jesus moment. I didn't tithe or any of that stuff when I came back to Jesus. I knew that I should, but I'm like, Jesus, like what's my $10 to, to such a big church or whatever it is, right? Um, but it's like as you kind of learn to like, well, it doesn't matter about the amount. Like Jesus multiplies it to do more. Like, And I've even just seen like here at our church, we're not a big church, but the fact that we're here today is like, that Jesus has taken the little that many of you probably think, well, what's this matter to, to this big problem or whatever? Um, but it's like literally we're here today because of people's faithfulness like you guys and many of them from Arizona who aren't here and never even been here. And they just supported our ministry because they gave $100 here or $20 over there. And it's just like such a little bit can make such a huge difference. And again, just talking about this boy, he's got a little lunch. And Andrew, just being the honest guy, I'd probably say the same thing to Jesus. Like, yeah, he's got some food, but like, pfft, like that's not even enough for me. Like, that's not even a man's lunch, Jesus. That's a boy's lunch there. And it says, Jesus said to him, verse 10, have the people sit down. All right, it's almost like he's not going to worry about this whole thing. Have them sit down. The other gospel accounts say that they got them into groups of hundreds and fifties. Like, they broke them up a little bit. Like, hey, sit down, circle up, all this stuff. Um, and basically what Jesus is saying, like, watch, watch here, bring it here, see what I can do. Bring the little that you have. And I would even say that Jesus is probably like, bring the little faith that you have, right? He tells the disciples that like, oh, you of little faith. Um, that's, I believe when Peter's walking on the water and he starts to drown, oh, you of little faith, right? But I think even in this moment, right? Well, what is this to so many? And Jesus is like, have them sit down, you of little faith. But here's the thing, like, if, as long as we have a little faith, we can see some pretty big things. Like if we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can see some big things. Oh, you of little faith, like just bring what you have here as insignificant as you think it is. As you don't think it's going to make a small dent or scratch in nothing. Bring it here. See what I can do. Have the people sit down. Jesus is taking, he's, uh, he's what do you call it? He's taking authority. He's taking charge. Um, he's like, we're about to open the kitchen, boys, right? Have them sit down. Um, and it says this, now there was much grass in the place. This tells us that just kind of the time and season most likely was Passover. That would be in the springtime, right about this time, actually. Um, and I believe this is actually like the, I don't know if today is or this past week, next week. I don't know, the Orthodox next week is like the Orthodox uh, Passover, all that stuff. Uh, but anyway, springtime, grass is coming alive. You guys live in Texas. You see it all out here today. Like you got, I got to mow my grass every other day now um, because it's just growing, right? They're sitting in the grass, but this also tells us a little bit. Um, for one, there's some people that would make much of this because it's a very uh, actual picture of Psalm 23. You guys are familiar with Psalm 23? Like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. All that stuff is like literally here. It's Jesus taking control of the whole situation. He's like, I'm the shepherd. Sit down. Where are they sitting down? They're sitting down in green pastures. What's he about to do? He's about to feed them, right? In the presence of their enemies and whatever else is going on because he loves them, he cares for them, he has compassion on them. And that's one thing the other gospel accounts tell us too is that these people come, the disciples want to, to brush them away, like tell them to go get their own food, Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, you give them something to eat. To eat. Well, where are we going to get some bread for these people to eat, right? And then it says that when he sees the people, 
He has compassion on them. He cares for them. Luke tells us that he teaches them of the kingdom of God, right? It's like he comes off his, this boat. He's had a long day. The people come. There's a need. Jesus makes time for them. Right? Mark tells us that he has compassion on the people and that he healed many of their sick. Comes off the boat. He's had a long day. He heard of his friend who died. And the people's like, hey, can you heal my buddy? Yeah, bring him to me. But how are we like Jesus? I mean, this is what we should be like in our lives. But man, isn't it hard? I mean, I'll be the first to admit it's hard. You come home from a long day of work or a long week, whatever happens, um, and then God brings some people into your life that need help. But man, we're like, ah, oh, too tired for that. I don't got time. I don't have the mental capacity for that or anything. But man, Jesus, he's just like, bring him, bring him here. He has compassion on them. And one of the other ones says that he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. So he cares for them. And I think he's showing the disciples too, like, hey, ministry isn't done just because you're you're tired right like life's about ministry and and these things and like imagine the disciples like tell them to go home and jesus like actually we're about to open open the restaurant for dinner tonight it's gonna be a long night boys buckle up um would you be happy about that if you're following jesus that like it'd be like seriously i don't know i feel like i'd be that way sometimes but jesus um tells them to sit down there's grass in the place. He's the good shepherd says, so the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Again, that's just the men. It says, then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So he took the loaves, these biscuits, and even if they were loaves, like, I mean, let's just be honest, five loaves for 5,000 men, like, that's not much, right? Like, one loaf, like, I, me and my family and kids could eat that in a day, you know? Um, so even if it was a big one, you're like, well, that's too small. You're just being over dramatic, Nick, or, and so are the other scholars and theologians. But again, the whole point is like, this is nothing to them. And so they bring it to Jesus. He takes it and he had given thanks. And I want to point that out. If you have a highlighter, um, a marker, you have a Bible or a Bible app, I would highlight that when he, he had given thanks. That's a huge thing. Or it tells us in other gospel accounts that he blessed it. But it wasn't that he blessed the food, like, oh, this food is so amazing, whatever. Like, he blessed the Father. And there's a big difference there. It's like, we want to know who the blessing's from. We don't bless the things, we bless the blesser. You know what I'm saying? And so Jesus is making an example of this. He's like, hey, bring the little that you have. We're going to be thankful to the Father for this little. And I just want to put this point out there for you and me and anyone listening today. Is like, be grateful for whatever you have. Be thankful to God, right? I mean, we can be downers on our whole life, like, oh, but I don't have enough. But do you have enough for today? I guarantee you, you probably have enough for today. You're like, but I don't have any food. Well, let's go to your pantry and look. Well, it looks like you got some ramen, right? They're all stacked up there. That's food for today. Can we be thankful? Thank you, Father, that I got food for today. Like for me sometimes, like, hey, do we have food? Like I go there, it's like, no, but we got peanut butter and we got bread. And I'm like, we're going to be all right. I don't know. Nobody else, you guys don't feel that? I, I was preaching hard right there. I love peanut butter and bread. <laughs> Uh, all day, that's all I need, and some water, of course, to wash it down. Not milk, I don't really like milk, so, but anyways, I'm weird like that. But you can look at your pantry, what do you got? We got food for today. It might not be the thing that you want, filet mignon, this big meal that you had planned, but you got enough for today, right? It's like, oh man, but I don't have enough money, right? But we have, en we have what we need for today. And this is um, 2 Peter again. He says that God, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, Jesus. And, and it's through him that we have these things, right? It's like, again, we have everything we need, not everything we want. There's a big difference. But if we can be grateful to God, our Father in heaven who loves us, Right, Jesus even says that at one point, like, man, like your earthly fathers, like you don't give your kids a snake when they ask for breakfast, do you? Or a scorpion when they're like, hey, dad, what's for lunch? Well, here's some scorpions. You know what I mean? Like that's literally the picture. Or a stone. Hey, I'm hungry. Well, here's some rocks. And Jesus is making this big like example of this. But he's like, man, your heavenly father, he cares for you. He knows what you need before you even ask. And so like if we, we have what we need, if we have what we need, shouldn't we be thankful Shouldn't we be grateful? 
Right? Shouldn't we give thanks as Jesus does here? Right? It's the little things. It's little boy's lunchable. To everybody watching there would be like, what are you doing, Jesus? It's like, thank you, Father, for this food, for this provision. We don't know all of what the prayer might have looked like or the thanks would have looked like, but he's giving thanks to the Father for what is provided. And I just want to encourage you in your life, give thanks to the Father for what's provided in your life. It might not be what you want, but it's what you need right now. Okay? Sometimes seasons look better than others. The nice thing about seasons is that seasons change. They just take time. Um, but anyways, he gives thanks. Then it says, then he distributed it to them who were seated. Now, I don't think Jesus went around, um, you know, single server for five party of 5,000, and like, he's the only server there. It tells the, him that he broke it in other accounts, gave it to the disciples to go give out for people to eat. Now, this is, again, a little thing. It's a little act of obedience. He gives thanks. He starts to break the bread, all that stuff. He's giving it to the disciples. Now it's up to the disciples to distribute it to the people around them. Right? Like, what am I going to do with this? Right? Goes and gives it. Hey, I guess, you know, take some, pass it around. I don't know what this looked like. I really want to see this on, you know, the, the replay when we get to heaven. Like, hey, can I get that instant replay of feeding the 5,000? What did that look like? Did, like, literally people just take a bite, pass it on, and it grew back? I don't know. Like, did, they, did you just break it? They handed it to him. All of a sudden, it became more. There had to be something. Or was it like literally they took a little bite-sized grain? Maybe they ate it in their stomach, and then it expanded. I don't know. Like, what did this look like? How did it go down? I don't know. But the disciples, they had a choice to make here is like to have a little act of obedience. They weren't really doing anything other than just passing out what was given to them. The same thing in our lives is like, man, God's calling in you, me, to little acts of obedience that don't make sense. It doesn't look like much. We think it's insignificant. It's not going to work. But when you go out there in an act of obedience, say, all right, thank you, Father, for this. I don't know how this is going to go down. But you go over, say again to that example earlier, and to that person like, hey, can I pray for you? I don't know why God put me on your heart. You're honestly the last person I want to talk to today, but can I pray for you? you know, sometimes that happens in our life where God will put the one person, like anybody but them, and God's like, nope, they're the only one I want you to go talk to. Fine. Can I pray for you today? Right? The little act of obedience, and all of a sudden you know, things will happen that you wouldn't even expect. And they start opening up like, man, uh, I've really been feeling like I need to pray with someone, so thanks for asking. Like, you'll see God work through little acts of obedience. But here's the flip side of it. You won't see God work when you don't do little acts of obedience. And I would say this, most of the time, the things God calls you to are little acts of obedience. It's not something big, huge. Hey, I need you to go up on a mountaintop with the banner, all this crazy stuff, right? It's like, it's not for most people. Hey, I want you to move states and go plant a church, right? But even in that, to me, is like, that's a little act of obedience. Are you going to do it or not? But it's oftentimes in little Acts of obedience, right? Little things, little sins. Can you stop getting drunk? Stop being so angry, right? Start repenting. Start being loving. Little acts of obedience. Can we start to do these things? But if we don't, we're going to miss out on a lot of things that God would do in our life and through our life. Little acts of obedience. And so they're going, um, distributing it to all who were seated. It says, so also the fish as much as they wanted. Again, I really wish I, we could see what this looked like. How did this work? Um, like, literally, it's a miracle. It doesn't make any sense. But again, I just wish what it, I could see. Like, did this fish grow back? And did it? I don't know. But it says, as much as they wanted. It says, and when they had eaten their fill, other, other gospel accounts will say that they ate until they were satisfied, until they were full. Right? And these are men. 5,000 men. The other ones say, besides women and children. So these are grown men. And any grown men here, like, you know, like, hey, like, we can eat, right? I don't know. I feel like I can, I can eat, right? So if like, I'm going to eat till I'm satisfied, we're going to be here for a minute. Um, maybe some of you feel that way. These are grown men. They're eating till they're satisfied. But not only these people eating, but it's like the, the women, the children, they're eating. They eat till they had their fill. And then Jesus tells them this, tells his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost, right? Hey, hey, go gather it all up, right? Again, one of those things like, what? Like, we started with nothing. Now you want me to go gather up whatever's left? And I don't know. I, I wonder if they saw the fragments everywhere 
or if this was something like as they went, they started to notice like, oh, there's a piece there. There's, there's a piece over here. And they start to gather it up that nothing may be lost. And it says verse 13. So they gathered them up and filled up how many baskets? Twelve. Twelve. How many disciples are there? Twelve. Right? They filled them up with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had ate, eaten them. Right? And so I think this is God's way, Jesus' way of like he's put them to the test. Hey, where are we going to get food for these people? Jesus, we can't get food for these people. I got a little boy's lunchable here. We could try and do that. But that's, what's that to so many people? And Jesus is like, bring it here. Have them sit down, right? And like little by little, as they start to, like, their, their obedience, but not in any big, crazy way, um, but even the, just Andrew bringing the little boy there, like, hey, what, what do we have? He's like, well, we got a little boy with some food. That's an act of obedience, like being observant and trying to bring something to Jesus, and even though it seems insignificant. And then little by little, Jesus just proving them wrong. Have them sit down. All right, Jesus. Hey, everyone, you need to sit down. Dinner's going to start shortly. I don't know how this is going to work, but I've seen him do some pretty cool things before. Never seen him do this, but uh, we're going to see what happens. And then little by little, they're all fed. Little by little, after dinner's over, it's like they're picking all these things up. And each disciple has enough to fill one basket. And I think it's just a picture to show them. It's like, I have everything you need. You don't need to worry. Right? It's like, if you just trust me, a little faith, a little faith, a little obedience, a little trust, a a little bit of even like, sacrifice like bring the little that you have to me i'll show you that i'm more than enough right the disciples like you ever thought this too i get to take it back to the tithing example when me and my wife got married like bills were tight we didn't have very much money um and tithing was one of those things to me i'm like can we tithe i don't know like can we afford to tithe right which is not the right question to ask i'm just being honest with you Uh, if you're new to the fervent church i'm honest maybe more than i should be sometimes but i hope you see that i'm a real person and going through this too but it's like we don't have very much how are we going to do this and then we just made a decision and we're just like we're just going to tithe whatever it is you know and like you bring the little that you have um, and you just make that a priority but then little by little you'll start to see God do things and for us there was one time I remember specifically we wanted to go on a vacation I think this was when we only had Lucas um, and we wanted to go on a vacation uh, to San Diego. You know, San Diego is what, five or six hours from Tucson. Uh, we wanted to do that, but we didn't have much money. And then we it's like, oh, now it's time to tithe. It's like, well, if we tithe, we can't, like, that's some of the money that we need to get there. You know what I'm saying? And then my wife is very good and faithful, like, babe, we just got to tithe. I'm like, all right, you know, <laughs> like, we tithe, pray. I don't know how this is going to work out, or maybe we won't even go on vacation. Well, a week or so later, we get this check in the mail that's literally like a rebate from something for the car that we bought like a year or two earlier. You know, I don't know if you've ever had that happen. Uh, I thought it was like spam at first, like, Psh, this isn't real. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know, maybe we should try cashing it. Let's see if it works. <laughs> turns out and it worked right it's like to me it's like that's a little example of God's like hey just trust me in the little things you don't understand how it's going to work out but I got you I got you I'm more than enough I'll satisfy you you know I might not give you what you want but I'm going to give you what you need Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 6 like seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and he's going to take care of all the things all the things that Jesus mentions is food clothing like shelter, like we're all worried and stressed. What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? And, and Jesus would say, look at the birds. You're in Texas. There's a million of them. <laughs> and, you know, look at the birds. They're not worried about what they're going to eat. And your heavenly father cares more about you than the birds. Let me assure you of that. And he's like, seek his righteousness. Seek his kingdom. And he will, he will give you what you need. He's more than enough. Um, so he tells them, Pick it all up. They gather 12 baskets. Again, I think a picture of just, man, like, you have little faith. You doubted, but Jesus, even in our doubt, he'll still uh, come through in certain ways like that. Verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. 
Uh, they probably had some speculation beforehand, right? Hey, I heard from the woman at the well that this might be the Messiah, and so I came here to see. Hey, I, I heard from the, the official who had his son healed, who was about to die, that you said that he would live, and he went back home, and the next thing you know, he's alive. Hey, I, I heard from the guy who was outside the temple courts, and he couldn't walk for 38 years, that you went in there, and you told him to pick up his mat and walk, and he was healed, right? These people are coming to Jesus because they've heard and seen Maybe they haven't seen yet. Maybe they've only heard. And they're coming there, and now they're like, maybe this is the Messiah. Or they're even, they say, this is indeed. Right, we've seen miracles here. Right, this whole picture, too, if you think about it, like this is during Passover. It's telling us that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the one who will sustain us. If you think about it, the Passover, the original Passover with Moses and Exodus, they're going through the wilderness. And what does God provide for them? Like, like what are we going to eat? And God's like, don't worry about it. Right? And what happens? Manna from heaven, like bread from heaven. Literally, the heavenly bread. I would like to know what that was, too, when we get to heaven. Like, can I get some of that manna? I just want to see. I want to taste it. It was like, is it all that? Like, it's got to be really good. Or was it like super, like, basic um, level HEB stuff? You know, I don't know. Like, maybe God was just like, hey, I'm just trying to humble you. And we just... I don't know. I'd like to try some, but it's a picture, right? It's like, that's the Passover. It's like, hey, I'm going to sustain you. I'm going to give you bread from heaven, right? And you don't need to worry. I'm going to be everything that you need. And here we are on Passover with Jesus, the second Passover that, that Jesus, during his ministry at least, right? And he's making this scene. It's a, very, it's a picture of him being the bread of life. And now I can say that very confidently. Some of you are like, how are you going to get that? Well, read the rest of John chapter 6. Jesus says, I am the bread. I, I am the life. He says that if anyone eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood, then you have life. You abide in me and I'll abide in you. He's like, but if you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, well, you have no part in me, right? And that's where it goes, and we'll see this in a few weeks. Um, John chapter 6, verse 66, people are like, man, this is a hard word. This guy's kind of crazy. This is a strong teaching. I don't know if I like it. And it says that many people turn back from following him. Because they saw the things that he was doing. They thought it was really cool and exciting when the miracles were happening, when Jesus was taking a very small amount of food and making it into enough for everybody to eat. Well, that's cool. I'll follow you then. But if you're like, hey, man, you've got to follow me. You've got to live the life like that I live and die to yourself like I did. Well, I, I don't know if I want to do that. But anyways, these people they are seeing, man, this is, I think this is the prophet so the one who's to come, right? The, the Old Testament says there's going to be one greater than Moses who would come. That would be the one that they're awaiting, right? The Messiah. And then it says, verse 15, the last verse for today, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Or you might have heard, maybe you've heard me say or someone else at a different church where we talk about like pe these people wanted to make Jesus king, like a political leader like hey you know what we need to get rid of Herod and Caesar and let's have Jesus be the the new Caesar and all that stuff right I think some people might think that we just make that up but like literally it's right here in the text uh, Jesus he sees these people want to make me king right why well because he's showing all of these miracles right they're oppressed by Rome in many different ways shapes and forms like and you could think of it I don't know how what today's equivalent would be but these people are oppressed in the, these ways they see jesus as a sign of hope and um, they want to put him on the throne now it tells us that they have the wrong understanding of what jesus came to do again man's interpretation of god's word is oftentimes like skewed or wrong altogether these people had a interpretation of god's um, old testament stuff prophecy that god's going to come rule and reign, right? They probably read through uh, David when God made a promise to David, like, hey, I'm going to establish my throne with you forever. They're probably like, oh, sweet. This is going to be like here on like earth. Like we're never going to be the best nation ever. Um, we're never going to go through any hard things or wars or any of that stuff because we're God's people. And if you know and you watch the news, that's not true, is it? Israel is like always at war. Something's going on there with Israel. But it says, when Jesus perceived they were going to make him king, he withdrew to the mountain again by himself. 
because Jesus didn't come to be the king, a political ruler. He came to die as a lamb, as a sacrificial lamb, because he had more important things to do than to be president of Israel or whatever may be, right? I just want you to understand that, like, Jesus had in mind the most important thing. Would that have made a difference if he became the king right then and there? Yeah, sure, but our sins would need to be atoned for, right? It's like, there's more important matters than the things that sometimes we think are are important. I don't know if you have kids. Sometimes it's this way. They don't understand. Like, but why can't we do this? Like, well, because there's more important things. They don't see the bigger picture of what you're trying to explain to them. And oftentimes we're like kids. We can't see the bigger picture. And these people very much so. Like, they don't know, but they want to put him as king. But Jesus withdraws by himself. And John, I think, is one who mentions it. Or maybe it was Mark. But he says he didn't do something yet because his time had not come, right? It's like he's very specific, very intentional with all that he does. Jesus never, you know, missing a beat, never in the wrong place at the wrong time. He's right where he needs to be all the time, but he's like, I'm not going to let them make me king because I came here for a work that they don't know anything about yet. But to close this up today, and then we'll, we'll get into communion and remember Jesus um, life, death, and resurrection. But to close it up, the little things. We see this little boy's lunchable, and I think it also speaks to us of the faith of a kid, you know, who entrusts his lunch to Jesus. But my mom made me that lunch today, right? Like, I don't know, like he, he brings it to Jesus. And you can even see that sometimes where Jesus will literally do something through your kids, like the little things that your kids have, and you'll see it, and Jesus will use it to minister to you. But I just want to encourage you today, the little things in your life, the little faith, you're like, but I don't have big faith to do things. You just need a little bit, a little obedience where you're like, hey, I don't, I don't know what to do. Jesus is like, hey, can you, just, can you just give this to somebody, right? Maybe Jesus gives you food to, to hand out. Maybe sometimes this is me, like I'm driving down the road, and specifically like in Austin. There's some homeless people on the side. A lot of times I don't have anything to give to them. But sometimes I'm like, look over the seat. I'm like, well, I got a banana. You know, and then you try to give them a banana. Like to me, I'm like, well, I'll at least try most of the time. Like, oh, no, I'm good. I don't want the healthy stuff, I guess. <laughs> they want something else. I don't know. But sometimes I'm like, but what do I have to give? And what do you have to give? What little things, little act of obedience with a little bit of faith, a little bit of trust, a little bit of, I don't know what you want to call it, but you just, you bring it to Jesus to see him do the big things. It's the little things, not just all in a day, but each day, every day for the rest of our life, if we just do the little things that Jesus calls us to do, if we stay close to Jesus, we will see him make a big impact in our lives. But I also believe you're going to see Jesus make a big impact through your lives. But if you don't even do the little things, Jesus says, man, like, it's like he'll entrust the people who are faithful with more. But he's like, if you can't even do the little things, how do you expect me to give you more? Right? Just think about that. If any of you work at a job or maybe you're in charge of people, right? And someone wants to like get more um, responsibility, you're like, I, you can't even mop the floor, man. Like, I, you're never even here to get your job done now, but you want more pay and more responsibility. I, and I just want to encourage you. It's even the, th the same in our lives with Jesus where it's like, hey, it's, it starts with the little things. And maybe it's always going to be the little things. That's okay. Just... It's the little things, little faith, little obedience. We're going to trust Jesus and we're going to see him do some pretty big things in our lives, through our lives. And honestly, you never know what God's doing through those little things when you're like, I don't know why I'm here. And then maybe when we get to heaven, someone's going to be like, you're the person that I saw persevering. You're there. Um, and it, it encouraged me. You know, you don't know what God's doing. But with all that said, I just want to say don't um, count the little things as insignificant or that God can't use you, or whatever it is. He can use everything, and it's uh, the little things that we, we do, we bring to Jesus, that we can see him do big things through. So with that said, we're going to pray. We're going to pass out communion. We'll end with communion and a, a song of worship. But Father, we thank you for this time that we can read your word. We thank you that you preserved your word. I thank you that this account of of you feeding 5,000 people is in all four gospel accounts, giving us a bigger, clearer picture of what's going on. But God, I pray that you've encouraged us um, to some degree, Lord, that we would 
see the little things that we have in our life, the little things that we can do, even though it might not seem like much to us or mean much to us. Lord, maybe it means everything to somebody else. And God, and I pray that we would have faith. I pray that we would have obedience to bring these things unto you and to obey the things that you're calling us to do, Lord. And I pray that you would use them to multiply, um, to do great things. Just as you multiplied this little boy's lunch, to feed a multitude. Lord, I pray that you'd take the little that we have, that we bring to you, that you would use to multiply it, to feed many, to touch many, to reach many, so that people may ultimately know you. And so, God, um, just encourage our hearts. Maybe we need conviction even, Lord. We've been holding back because we're afraid to give the little things or to do the little things. But, God, I pray that you'd give us courage, that we wouldn't be afraid. And that we know that you're with us and that you're working in us and around us all the time. And so thank you for this time. As we look to communion, God, we remember your, that Jesus, that you came, you lived, you died. It's your body that was broken for us. You didn't become king because you had more important things to do. And that was to live a perfect life for us, to die a death for us, God. And as we look to communion, I pray that we'd remember this your body broken, your blood shed, that we may be made whole. And God, I pray that um, if any of us here today don't know you, if we never accepted your gift to us, gift of salvation, pray, Lord, today would be the day, a little thing that is actually a very huge thing, but I pray that we would receive your gift. Simple as saying, Lord, I receive you. I welcome you in. I believe in you. God, that you would change us from the inside out and that we would see great things that you do for your glory. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.